Hi everyone. If you want to install Linux Mint in a dual boot setup with Windows, then you need to be careful with where you install the Linux Mint boot files. In Windows, you would generally have a 100 megabyte EFI system partition where this is stored. And when you install Linux Mint, you would also use the same EFI partition. There is sufficient space on it and it works fine. So what could be the issue? Microsoft is known for removing anything that is not related to Windows in the EFI partition. This, for example, can happen after a Windows update. At first, it may seem all is well after the install. Everything is there and working, but maybe months later after a Windows update, your Linux Mint information in the EFI partition will be gone and you won't be able to boot into Linux Mint. Okay, so what about creating another EFI partition and have Linux Mint use it instead? In the installer, even if you specify to use a different partition, Linux Mint won't use your partition and will still use your first EFI partition. So why have this option if it's not going to be used? That's a good question. But fortunately, there is a way to get it to work and I will show you how to have it use a separate EFI partition so you can install Linux Mint safely. So I'm going to Disk Management. So I have here disk zero, my drive, 128 gigabytes, and it has the C drive here, and there's my 100 megabyte EFI system partition. And then disk one is my USB drive, 32 gigabytes. This is where I'm going to be putting the Linux Mint ISO on. Linux Mint requires a minimum of 20 gigabytes of disk space. So I'm going to be shrinking my C drive here. And I'm going to set aside 50 gigabytes for Linux Mint. Okay, the space has been allocated here. And now I'm going to go and download Linux Mint. Go to linuxmint.com. I'm gonna go to download. And then there's different flavors. There's Cinnamon, which is the sleek and modern innovative desktop. And then there's XFSC, which is a light and simple desktop environment. And then there's Mate, which is the classic traditional desktop environment. And there's also as well as the Edge, which is for the most modern hardware. I'm going to go back up and I'm going to download Cinnamon. And it's a 2.9 gigabytes ISO file. And you can select one of the mirrors to download. So I have already downloaded it. And the next thing you'll need is to download Rufus. I'm going to rufus.ie. And this program will write the ISO image onto your USB drive. Scroll down and download the portable version. And I have it already downloaded. I'm going to open up Rufus. Yes. Yes. All right, it's already selected my USB drive here, as we can see. And now I'm going to select my ISO file, the Linux Mint file. And I'm going to select it. And then I'm going to hit start. And write in ISO image mode, recommended, OK. And it says here, this image uses SysLinux. And so hit yes, so I can download the necessary files. Hit OK. All right, it has completed. I'm going to go to disk management. And we can see here, there's my USB drive. And now I'm going to reboot my computer and boot into the USB drive. All right, I've booted into the USB drive and grub comes up and we see here, say start Linux Mint, hit enter. Okay, it has booted into the Linux Mint live environment. So before installing Linux Mint, I'm going to need to make a change so that Linux Mint will not install the boot files into the first EFI partition. And to do that, I first need to confirm my drive, which will likely be slash dev slash SDA. So I'm going to open up a terminal and I'm going to sudo in and I'm going to type in F disk space dash L will list my disks, scroll up dev SDA and 128 gigabytes here. So this is the disk. So it's dev SDA. And then now I'm going to run parted. Parted is partition editor. And it will be parted and then your disk. So it will be dev SDA. And then I'm going to hit P for print. And this will list the partitions on my drive here. 
and we see here that the first partition, the 100 megabytes system partition, I'll have to remove the boot and ESP flags from it, as during the install process, it's going to look for these flags, and if it sees them, then it's going to install the files there, which we do not want. And then after the install, we can put them back on. So to remove the flags, set, and then the partition number, which is one, and then boot, and then off, and then hit P to print. And we see here that the flags are no longer there, so that's good. And we can hit Q to quit. And now we can start the install. English, continue. English, continue. I'm going to install the codex. Here it says no detected operating system, which is not true, as we have Windows. And the reason why is because the flags on the EFI partition were removed, so it does not know about it. So hit something else, hit continue. All right, so we see my dev SDA, SDA2, SDA3, which is my C drive here. And then there's the free space that was allocated in Windows. And I'm gonna hit the plus sign. And I'm gonna create a new EFI partition. I'll have it 512 megabytes. And I'll use it as EFI system partition. Hit OK. All right, we see it created and then go back to free space, hit the plus sign. And then to keep it simple, I'm gonna use the remaining space and I'm going to have the mount point as slash, as root. Okay. All right, and the two partitions are there, SDA5 and SDA6. And here at the bottom, it says device for bootloader installation, SDA5, the separate EFI partition and then hit install now. It's asking to confirm, continue. This is the screen used for the time zone, so select the area that you're in, continue, and enter in your name, computer name, and username, and require my password to log in, continue. Okay, it's now installing, and you can go down here and click on the arrow, and you can get a status of what's being done. Okay, so the installation is completed. And now we'll need to go back and depart it to put back the flags. Go to continue testing. And going to go back into parted. P print. And set one boot on and then P to print again, and we see the flags are back, boot and ESP. Hit Q to quit, and now I'm gonna reboot. Going to log in. We're at the desktop here, but we'll notice that during the boot process, there was no bootloader, and there was no Windows option, so we're gonna fix that. Go into terminal sudo in, put in your password, and we're going to edit the default grub file, vi etsy default grub, and scroll to the bottom using the arrow keys or hit shift g to automatically go to the bottom, and then hit o to open a new line, and then type in grub disable os prober equals false, hit escape once, and then colon WQ to write and quit. And then next we're gonna run OS Prober. All right, we can see here it has found the Windows Boot Manager, it's found it. And now we're gonna make a new grub configuration and it's gonna include the Windows Boot Manager and it's also as well as going to include Linux Mint, grub, make config, dash O, slash boot grub grub.cfg all right we can see here that it's found linux images and it's also as well as found the windows boot manager and it's adding a boot menu entry for the ufi firmware settings and i'm going to hit df-h 
And we can see here dev SDA5, the EFI partition that we created earlier is used. So that is good. So all of the Linux Mint boot files and bootloader information is stored there. And now I'm going to restart again to confirm that grub comes up. All right, we see here Linux Mint at the top, and we also have the Windows Boot Manager. So we can do a boot between the two. And I am going to go into Windows just to confirm. All right, it's in Windows. So that's it. That's how you can safely install Linux Mint in a dual boot setup with Windows. I hope this video was useful, and I thank you for watching. Bye now.